Go ahead and join together and lift our voice and sing that song. Can you believe what the Lord has done?
We praise you, Lord. We magnify the name of Jesus. God, have your full right of way in our hearts and our minds this night. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come, O God. Heavenly Father, as we humbly come into your presence, O oh Lord, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would hear these needs of the saints, O oh Lord, that you would move upon these needs in a glorious fashion, demonstrations of signs and yes, wonders and Jesus. miracles, O oh Lord. Lord. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would open every mind and heart sitting here and watching here tonight to be susceptible to hear your word, that we would leave transformed to different from the way that we walked in. We give you the glory and the praise for the miracle work that you have started, and we give you glory and praise for the miracle work for which you still have in store. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's give them thanks tonight. Father, we love you. Jesus, we worship you, O oh God. Hallelujah, Lord our God. Hallelujah. God bless you, saints. Go ahead and say hello to one another. Let somebody know you're glad to see them. supposed to say no I can't believe it amen. amen because our God is a miracle worker amen. and he's on the throne I brought my revival vest tonight I hope that's okay on, amen, amen. I, as, as I was up here I was thinking you know what I gotta let Jack you know it's time for me to get some more Holy Ghost revival vests amen I love uh, I love a good revival vest amen the, the anointing's not in the vest but it does loosen things up a bit amen good to be here tonight good evening church Good to be here with all of you this evening, and we're going to hear from God tonight. We have a couple announcements I want to give to you. Just a, I said a couple. That's probably not uh, true. Let's just say a few. How's that? Uh, tomorrow night, we're starting our Foundations Bible Study, and uh, really, really excited about that. Just was sharing with someone before the service. Uh, two things that have uh, really gotten me stirred, and I've been uh, just so thrilled to uh, kick off uh, one new ministry and one uh, uh, revamp ministry, but our Foundations uh, Bible Study is going to be going for the next six weeks. If you're interested in being a part, it's Thursday nights. Uh, aside from the revival, it'll be each Thursday consecutive, and uh, then... Uh, all, all kind of go together. So we're asking people if you want to be involved in it to uh, make a commitment uh, for all those uh, six weeks. Uh, and uh, this will help you to get a basic uh, understanding of the Bible, at least as we understand it, and help you to see uh, just some things about Jesus, basic uh, uh, understanding about the Holy Ghost and God's power, but it'll help you to bring you up to speed. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of my strong convictions is that many believers struggle sometimes just with uh, beginning the, the kind of foundational understandings about who God is, Jesus, uh, what it means to pray, how the Holy Spirit helps us, and all those things. So if you want to be a part of that, talk to uh, Reuben. That's going to kick off. Uh, can you turn the highs down just a little bit there? Got a little echo chamber up here, and it's going to drive me nuts. Thank you. Um, 
Friday, there'll be a youth crew that's here at 7. Also, I, I uh, just want to mention this kind of from the, uh, uh, here from the pulpit as well. Tomorrow night, uh, uh, for any uh, uh, workers, any men that are available to help Pastor Heaps, he's uh, trying to get as much help as he can for the building up there. They're uh, making a lot of progress, but they've still got some more work to do. And as you remember, uh, Brother Joe was a great blessing to help us here. Let's go help him and uh, be a blessing to him and support uh, what uh, God's doing in the Hazeldale Church. Amen. And uh, be a part of that. Then the 15th, we have an open mic concert. Uh, we're opening that up to the community. We're going to be outreaching for that, all the above. And we go right into revival with uh, pastor, missionary, and now evangelist, oh, Artie Marin. So uh, it's going to be a Holy Ghost time. So brush up on your Portuguese. When he gets here, you can practice with him, okay? And the problem is he's, yeah. <laughs> we, got the, we got the Brazil twins up here. Amen. <laughs> Uh, that's their way of bragging that they've been to Brazil and you haven't gotten to go yet. Amen. Let's all be honest. I'll be frank if you'll be earnest. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You do, you do need to pray for Brazil. They're in a period of national transition. They're selecting a new president. There's a lot of support for a very strong communist-leaning uh, candidate. Uh, his last name is Lula. I can't remember what his first name is. But, uh, you know, we know that at the end of the day, however it shakes out, God's going to give us revival. But we want to pray for our churches there and pray for those cities uh, in Brazil and the nation of Brazil. We have uh, connections there. Of course, always praying for our workers all around the world, uh, India and other places as well, South Africa. As well, Saturday the 22nd, we have an impact team going into McVinville, Oregon. We're going to go help them and reach their city for Jesus. And then a Halloween outreach on the 29th. I think that's all for the announcements. I want to receive the offering tonight. Can we just give God thanks and praise as our ushers will come and help us tonight? Father, we're so grateful to you. Lord, we love you, God. We worship and adore you. We want to honor him tonight. First Timothy 6, command those that are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. You know, you can trust in God. Amen. There's a lot of things in life that will let you down, but God won't. He's faithful. God has been so faithful to us. Uh, who gives us richly all things to enjoy, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Uh, uh, I've never preached against having money. I don't think it's wrong for believers to have money, even uh, excess uh, uh, resources. I don't think that's wrong or evil or a sin. I've never thought that uh, the love of money is a problem. That's an issue. Can you say Amen. But to have, to actually have money or have resources, uh, if you do a little, uh, little research, you'll find out the average, uh, uh, years ago they did a test on the average person all around the world is, uh, uh, has uh, income of roughly $1,000 U.S. per year, but the average Christian was over four times that, uh, which is amazing. Now, again, that's not just the United States. That's all around the world that people uh, living on a much lower uh, subsistence than what uh, the average person here. But if you think about that, that really makes sense because God is a blesser. Amen. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. To, th to uh, look at someone who has money and to say that's a sin, well then what are you going to say when someone says the same thing to you? There's no defense for that. But the key is what do you do with it? What do you do with it? As God blesses you and God releases resources into your life, how many are blessed here by God tonight? Hasn't God been good, hasn't God been good to us, church? Thank God. Amen. You, you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not stuck back where you were when you got saved. You're not stuck in hopelessness and despair and frustration. It doesn't matter how good of a job you get when you're depressed and you're in despair. It's not going to help you. It's not going to be able to be a blessing. But then when you get things right with God, God can begin to bless you and help you. Amen. Let's give with a cheerful heart and honor our God and our King. 
as we give. Chris, will you pray a blessing on the gift and giver tonight? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to give back into your kingdom, Lord, and show you our hearts, Lord God. I pray blessing upon the gift and giver ten times fold, a hundred times fold, as you see fit in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. 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 God bless you as you give tonight. Bless you, musicians. We really appreciate you tonight. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of uh, Jeremiah and uh, chapter 18? Jeremiah and the 18th chapter. How many came here to meet with God tonight? Amen. I want to preach a message I've entitled Staying on the Potter's Wheel. Staying on the Potter's Wheel. I read an article about a woman named Tess Brigham. She's a licensed what is called a psychotherapist. So she's helping people with psychology, etc. And she specializes in treating uh, the age bracket of what's called the millennial generation. And she says, 90% of my patients are between the ages of 23 and 38 years old. But she noticed a dominant theme that they have that they're seeking help for she says, they come to me and they say, I have too many choices and I can't decide what to do. What if I make the wrong choice? I mean, no, that's probably not just limited to millennial age bracket. Yeah. We have a lot of choices. I've heard stories about uh, people that come from other nations and for the first time go to a super Walmart. And, uh, you know, in third world nations, you don't have stores that have, you know, uh, 10 of every known type. You know, just selecting toothpaste can be a bit of a challenge. That's why uh, I don't do the shopping in our family. Amen. I'd be stressed out all day long and uh, twice on Sunday. Amen. But listen, she's talking about this. Uh, they can't choose. They're not sure of what to choose. Uh, another uh, psychologist, uh, Barry Schwartz, uh, wrote in his book, The Paradox of Choice, uh, that people are more likely to regret their choices if they have too many options from which to choose. They either make poor choices or they make good choices but then feel bad about them or they refuse to choose at all, which, how I many you know that's a choice as well? Yeah. Brigham counsels her clients to practice self-awareness, identify their options, zeroing in on things they can control. It's easier to embrace the uncertainty of the outcome if they offer themselves grace and acceptance, that's about as good as it gets when you take God out of the equation. You just have to try to be more aware and more self-aware, but how many know that's a lot of limitation? But when God's invited into the equation and God's opinion, somebody say God's opinion. Say it this way, God's Word. Isn't the Word of God God's opinion? Well, what's God's opinion about? Let's see what He said. His Word, His opinion, it's the same thing. But when you invite God's opinion into the equation of your life and you begin to apply it to your life, you might find that all of a sudden that puts you on a course. And now you can begin to chart a course that's going to affect not just this life, but also an eternity. I want to preach a simple message I've entitled, Stain on the Potter's Wheel. A familiar passage here this evening, but one I believe God wants to refresh. Our church, the name of our church has been the Potter's House. And we take that out of this verse. You've heard me reference this or perhaps even preach on this before. But I believe God's going to take us down a little another angle on this and help us get some insight. Look in Jeremiah 18, verse 1 in your Bibles. It said, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. To the trap house? 
to, to the steakhouse? Well, I don't care if you go to the steakhouse. Some of you are like, why not? No, it says go to the potter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, the potter, making something at the wheel. And the vessel he made of clay was marred. It was disfigured. There was uh, deformities in it. You ever felt like that? You ever looked in the mirror and felt like that marred piece of clay? In the hand of a potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. And then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Oh, house of Israel. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, your power. I'm asking you to speak to us. God, transform us into your image. Give us a hunger and a thirst for you and for your word. In Jesus' name, and all God's people shout it out. Amen. Amen. Staying on the potter's wheel. I want to start with a question tonight, and that is, how does God shape our lives? Think with me for a moment about the potter. Because in ancient times, most vessels uh, that were used for storing or holding things, especially liquids such as cups and bowls and, uh, and uh, 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 vases, etc., would be made out of clay. Clay uh, is one of the most useful uh, tools to make uh, those uh, things because it's uh, in its, in its uh, wet form and in its, in its uh, natural form when it's in the ground. Uh, it's soft, it's pliable, it can be shaped, it can be formed. But the key to making a good vessel is not primarily the clay, although that's important. The key is the, the uh, potter's hand, uh, the skill of the potter, the ability to weed out, as you say, or to spin out the deformities. They would put the lump of clay on the wheel, and you can still get these today, where you pump it with your foot, and it'll begin to spin it around. I remember being in about... Uh uh, sixth grade, uh, and a uh, lady was there doing a demonstration, a pottery demonstration, and she's got that wheel going around in a circle, uh, and she's beginning to uh, mold it and shape it, and it was incredible. There's an art to it. It began to it went from this lump, but you know, we, we do start out kind of as a lump, don't we? Feeling a little lumpy tonight? Amen. God can help you. Uh, but, uh, but then she would poke her finger in the middle, her thumbs, uh, and it would uh, cause a crater, and then she'd begin to spread that out. And if you've ever seen anybody do this, it's incredible, a skilled uh, potter. Then our scripture speaks also of the clay. Clay is an interesting material because if you really uh, uh, kind of dig into clay, what it boils down to is it's a certain type of dirt, but it's not just dirt alone. But it's also dirt with moisture. It's moist and it's soft enough, but it also has qualities that stick together. There's different types of soil. I'm not going to go into all that because it's not the most fascinating study for me and probably for most of you. But there's something about clay that it has this quality where it can begin to be shaped. It can begin to be formed and fashioned. And when it's on the wheel, even though it starts out as a lump, now it can begin to become something useful. Humans are not just flesh with a spiritual element. Because how many know we are the clay that the potter wants to mold? But we're not just flesh with a spiritual element. We are spirits with a physical body. Then we have a third part. If you've ever looked at your spouse and said, man, men are complicated or women are complicated or children are complicated. That's a true story. Some, some people don't think men are very complicated and, and they're really not until you start trying to talk to them and find out what they're thinking. And you realize men are also complicated. Amen. Just not always as complicated as women. <clears throat> let's just keep the ball rolling. Hallelujah. That was the punchline. All right, let's just keep moving here. The third part is our soul, our consciousness, our thoughts, our will, our attitudes is the third part. So again, the question, how does God then, the potter, shape us the clay? God shapes us through his voice. Well, you look in your text in, in verse 6 through 10. We didn't read 
uh, the verses after 6, but we'll use 6 as kind of a connection point. He says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? God speaking, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it, if, someone say, if, that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. Verse 9, And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do, uh, does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit in other words, God says, listen, when I begin to speak, if you will listen to what I'm saying, and then if you will begin to do it, then I can shape your life and you'll be blessed. If you don't, then I can't, and you'll be cursed. Our ear, our ears, are part of our flesh, part of our body. But here's something interesting, is we can hear the preaching of the Word of God through our physical ears, and yet as we hear it through the flesh, it can come through our, through our body, it can come down and get into our mind and our heart, and then it can actually affect our spiritual side if we allow it to. I know some of this is review, but I want you to stay with me because I'm going somewhere with this. My question is, what are you being shaped by? And, and more importantly, secondly, are you being shaped by God and by the voice of God? Are you following Jesus' voice in 2001, September 11th? We know the airplanes crashed in the Twin Towers, but one of them, another one, crashed into the Pentagon. And a man, an officer by the name of Isaac Hoopy was nearby, but happened to be outside the building. Immediately, he started helping people to get out of the building, and in some cases, carrying them out. This man became a hero. But he wanted to do more, wearing only his short-sleeved blue police uniform. He had no mask, no coat, uh, not even a handkerchief. He ran back into uh, the uh, Pentagon again. It's billowing with smoke. There's fires inside. Someone yelled at him, stop. Uh, and he says, we got to get people. And he runs inside, suffocating on smoke. He heard the flames. He heard the uh, structural cracking, etc. But he started calling out, is anybody in there? Is anybody here? A man named Wayne Sinclair with five co-workers were crawling through the rubble and lost all sense of their direction. They're in a, see, when you, you always think that you're just going to act cool whenever something uh, uh, like this happens, but you never know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. They're disoriented. They're crawling through. They have no idea where even the next door is. Uh, they're they're, they're going to die. Uh, and they cry out when they hear him. And this uh, man, this officer says, head towards my voice. Uh, follow my voice. As they begin to follow his voice, they eventually made their way to him. He led them out of the crumbling building. And they all made a full recovery. If we're going to stay on the potter's wheel... That means, number one, we need to listen for God's voice. But number two, are you willing to follow God's voice? Which voice are you listening to? Can we say it this way? There's a lot of voices playing in the world today. Yes? Uh, smartphones haven't made that any easier, have they? There's the news. There's the, you know, uh, uh, some of us listen to audio books. There's the text messages and the emails and uh, all the different things uh, that, uh, that uh, are bombarding us. Then add to that if you're on social media and uh, then the phone calls and then the pressure from work uh, and uh, the radio and the music uh, industry, all these different sounds and voices. Uh, and sometimes it can just get a little bit overwhelming, but if we're we're not careful we can find ourselves being shaped by a lot of different voices and maybe the last of which is God's are you following Jesus voice here's another one if you're being shaped by God are you growing in obedience our text actually the 
context of this is to uh, Israel as a nation. God's speaking to the whole nation of Israel. He's saying, listen, I'm going to pour out my judgment. He's warning them. You know, let me tell you something about God. When God warns you, it's really good to probably pay attention. Amen. Hello. You know, the, the book of Revelations has these bowl judgments and these trumpet judgments. And there's going to be Christians left after the rapture. And, and uh, they, were, you know, they were saved at one time and they left the faith or they backslid or whatever. And I have a feeling God's going to be saying to them, hey, listen, I warned you this was coming. There's going to be people that aren't Christians that are saying, oh, my goodness, how could God allow this? And God's saying, I'm, I warned you. Are you listening? Are you growing in obedience? You know, as the clay stays on that wheel and allows itself to be shaped by the potter, you know, figuratively speaking, as we allow ourselves to be shaped by God, we should be growing in our relationship with Him, growing in our obedience to Christ. Are you growing in obedience to Jesus? Only you can answer that. Are you more obedient to him today than you were a year ago? Not too much more frustrating for a parent than a child who's less obedient today than they were a year ago. Oh, praise the Lord, you little devil. Is that what the Father says about you? Amen. No, it's not. He doesn't call you the devil. Only Jesus to Peter, right? Amen. But maybe sometimes the father's saying, yeah, I just keep talking to them, but I, don't, I can't tell if they're listening. <clears throat> again and again and again throughout the Bible, we hear about the connection between faith and obey. Faith and obedience. Are you being shaped by God? Are you looking more and more like Jesus every day? When people see you, do they see something different than the rest of the world? Can they say, like they said about Peter and John, we don't know what's got into these men, but we know they've been with Jesus. The Bible says there was this characteristic, this feature, this uh, something intangible, but they could tell they preached like Jesus. They spoke like Jesus. They had authority. There was a dominion. They said, man, these guys are like Jesus. Amen. Beloved, could anybody say that about us? They look more like Jesus today than they did six months ago or a year ago. <clears throat> which voice or what voice are you listening to? What voices are you allowing to dictate? Is it the voice of yourself? Are you like one third of men who responded when they were polled, I'm my own role model? How can you be your own role model? That's the whole point of having a role model. <laughs> you know, sometimes let's just be honest, us guys, it's like you didn't really put a lot of thought into that one, did you there, Slick? Amen. Are you your own GPS, your own spiritual GPS? Do you rely on your feelings to guide you through life? Don't you think that could be a little dangerous? Can you imagine people in hell saying, how did I end up here? And then the guy next to him says, yeah, I was wondering the same thing. And finally, someone has to enlighten them and say, yeah, well, your feelings aren't always the best GPS for you spiritually. See, God shapes us by His voice. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me, and I know them by name. Why are you living like that? Parents, do your kids ever ask you, Mom and Dad, why do we do this? Why, do we, why are we living this way? Why do we have these rules? If your, parents, if your kids never ask you, that's a problem. If they ask you and you don't know the answer, that's also a problem. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. All right, fine. Let's just go out and start living like the world. Is that your response? Or do you have some convictions? I remember I, remember I used to torment my dad. Dad, why don't we have a TV? Well, 
You know, and I would tell him, all my friends have TVs. He'd be like, yes, son, I know, but if your friend jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff? It's like, "Mm, I can't argue that one. (laughs) And then he began to sit me down and explain, son, the reason why we don't have a television is because not everything that comes across that screen is spiritually beneficial for our family. Found out from my brother Matt... You know, like Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. (laughs) Long before any kind of standards for ministry, anything like that, my brother Matt came home and he, uh, uh, or my dad came home, actually. They they used to have a television in the home. And my, uh, my dad came home from work and he saw my brother sitting on the couch. And uh, my brother told me this. Now, mind you, I, I'm, I don't know. This hasn't been verified by my mom, so I'm just throwing that out there. Amen. But uh, he said, for some reason, he was watching The Exorcist, which I know neither of my parents would have approved of. And uh, apparently it was right at the spot where the you know, doll's head is spinning around in circles. So, and, uh, Ch- or is that Chucky? Whatever it is. Maybe I'm getting my movies mixed up. But uh, the, the demonic doll. And so my dad saw it, and he said, what are you watching? And he went and grabbed the TV, and he took it out to the front of the house, literally, and he chucked it out on the yard. And it, needless to say, it, it wasn't really usable after that. And he said, we don't need a TV in our home. But he explained to me, son, just because something else, somebody else does something in the world doesn't mean that you just go along with it. You're going to have to decide, son, if these things are good for you, if they're healthy for you, if they're beneficial for your life. Let me ask you, do you have any convictions about your life? Do you have any convictions about what you watch or what you give yourself to, about your your shows that you uh, keep up with. Uh, Americans seem like they're uh, probably just as faithful to their TV shows than they are to church. Oh, did I? I wasn't supposed to. That wasn't in my notes. I'm sorry. They, it says they watch more of The Office than they read their Bible. Oh, can I preach here tonight? Do you watch more TV than you read the Word of God? You say, well, that's condemnation preaching. Well, maybe we just have a hard time with it because it's so right in our face and actually gets right down to the real issues. And we don't like anyone interfering with our entertainment, especially not pastor. Still love me? Okay, at least a couple of you. All right, amen. Are you looking more like Jesus? Can somebody say to you, why did you say that? Or why didn't you say that? Or why did you do that? And you say, you know what? Because I'm trying to be like my Savior. Why can't you just lie? Why can't you just stretch the truth? Why can't you just do this thing or that thing? Let's talk about thirdly then staying on the wheel, beloved. Because God doesn't want us to get off the wheel. He wants us to stay on the potter's wheel so he can continue to shape our life. There's some really good hope in our text. Look in verse 3, if you would. I went to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Ever come to church and... Maybe some not so good things God brought to the surface. Yeah. Or the preaching kind of touched on some sensitive areas. Ooh, that's a little sensitive. You know, I don't know. Careful. You, ooh. you know, it's like a wound that you start to take the bandages off of. And it's a nasty wound. Sometimes that's what happens when we, as we draw close to God. There's some deformities in there. Some pride, some fear, some unbelief. Some bad attitudes. I'm probably preaching this to the wrong church, I know. But just, just, just hold with me here tonight. <clears throat> Don't get discouraged. Oh, man, I am so messed up. You, not bad for preaching to expose flaws in our life. The only time when it's bad, when it, when it doesn't give any hope. You know me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hopeless 
I'm a dopeless hope fiend. Let's do it that way. Amen. I'm a dopeless hope fiend. I believe in hope. Amen. Amen. Kind of went the wrong way at the beginning there. Amen. <laughs> Not the first one. Got in trouble when I preached that sermon, a woman of great beauty the other night. Amen. <laughs> wow. Not from my wife, just from all you people. <laughs> How do we stay on the wheel? Three things. Here's number one. Somebody say number one. one. Listen for God's voice. <clears throat> Come to the house of God seeking to hear from God. Get into the Word of God. Put your audio Bible on or sit down and begin to read. I know this ancient technology called reading. I know it's ancient. You just want to see the YouTube video of the Bible. Amen. Watch the, I'll just wait for the next thing of the chosen to come out. Amen. I wish they would do one on Revelations. Amen. It's okay. You can admit it. Listen for God's voice. Will you let God tell you how to live? Beloved. Here's these people, millennials, and they're saying... We don't know how to make choices anymore. It's essentially what they're saying. There's so many choices. There's so many options. We don't know what decision to make, what choice to make. But what's amazing is when you begin to aim your life at Jesus, you begin to follow Christ and say that's the most important thing in life is to follow Jesus. All of a sudden, it helps you to begin to make these other decisions that can be so difficult without that. I'm surrendering my life to Jesus Paul says, uh, I'm not focused on the rear view mirror. I'm looking through the windshield of where Jesus wants to take my life. Amen. I'm not living uh, going backwards. Uh, I'm not going to live my life in my past, in my failures, in my, the mars and the flaws and the blemishes and the deformities. Uh, but I'm going forward for the future that Jesus has for me. Amen. Listen for God's voice. Here's a number, another one. Secondly, trust God's plan. Say it with me. Trust God's plan. Amen. Which plan are you trusting? We don't have this all figured out. But when you surrender to God and you bring God into the equation, you can trust God's plan. God has a better plan than we do. Can, can we all acknowledge that? Yes. Well, I've got this all figured out. If you do, can you please enlighten God? Because I'm pretty sure He's got it all figured out. And if you... Trust his plan. You know, they have this phrase, trust the process. And it's this idea that, you know, in companies or, uh, you know, in the workforce, you know, people start doing a particular task and then they start asking all these questions like, why do we have to do this? And why do we do it this way? And I want to do it this other way. And somebody will come along and say, hey, listen, trust the process. We've already tried those other things. Doesn't mean you're not smart. Doesn't mean you're not intelligent. But somebody else already figured this out for you and took some of the guesswork out. Now, we don't know everything. But God doesn't show us every step of the way. But as you're seeking Him, isn't that where faith comes in? You trust that obeying God is better than doing whatever you could come up with. Amen. Trust God's plan. God's wisdom. God's power, God's sovereignty, God's foreknowledge and ability to look down the road and to see into eternity. What do you think Christians in Europe were thinking when World War II was taking place? What do you think that people were thinking when here's this wicked, most horrible man, Adolf Hitler, was murdering the Jews? God's own people. And again, I, I don't believe that that's just all part of God's plan. But you have to trust that God sees a bigger picture. And there's bigger things at stake. I believe Adolf Hitler was not inspired by God. I believe he was inspired by hell. But see, God is over the devil. Are you hearing me tonight? Thirdly, if you're going to stay on the wheel, you have to keep your eyes on the prize. 
We're not just living for this life, but we're living for the life to come. <clears throat> my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I know them by name. Is anybody in here? Is anybody in here? Yes, we're here. We're, we need help. We can't make it out. We're blinded. We can't tell. Follow my voice. Follow my voice. And they made it to safety and to victory. One day we're going to make it into heaven and be with Jesus. The Bible says we do not know what we shall be. But there will come a day when one day we shall see him as he is. And then we'll know what we're supposed to be. For we will be like him. We will be like him. That's incredible. That's incredible. Don't get caught up. Don't get wrapped up in the drama of this world. The drama of our past. Because God has a future for each one of us, not just in this life, but in eternity, in heaven with him. That's what we need to get focused on, is on Jesus. Hearing his voice and obeying his voice. Will you pray and bow your heads with me tonight? God's speaking to hearts. We're going to pray this evening, beloved. God is talking to uh, people here tonight. I want to invite you in a moment. I'm going to invite you forward to come and talk to God. But just before we do that, I want to give the invitation for those that are here, perhaps you're not right with Jesus. God's dealing with your heart. You say, you know what, I need to get it right. Unsaved or backslidden. God's speaking to you tonight. You say, I can't play these games with God. I, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to miss out. I don't want to be there when all these things are shaking out. It's getting, our world is getting crazy. Things aren't, I don't think they're going to return to how they were. The new normal is not very normal. But that doesn't mean we have to live in fear. We have to live in anxiety. Because Jesus is saying, is there anybody in this room? Can you hear my voice? Can you hear my voice? Come and follow me. Come to me. I'm going to help you. If you're not saved or if you're not right with Jesus, will you lift up your hand? God's talking to you. First things first, you would just be honest and straightforward with God. Say, you know what, I, I can't do this. I can't live this way. I need to get right all across this place. If that's you, quickly lift up your hand. I want to change the appeal then. I want to speak to the saints of God. And I believe God's speaking to hearts tonight about a lot of different things here tonight. But whatever God challenged you about, whatever God spoke to you about, maybe you need to make some decisions. Maybe it's, this is a reset. You know what? I need to get refocused. Maybe there's, just like Martha, 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 you're worried and troubled about many things. But Mary has chosen that good part. She's sitting there at the feet of Jesus. She's listening to Jesus' voice, taking it all in. Jesus is crying out. He's talking out loud. He's knocking at the door. He's trying to get our attention. Will you listen to him? Begin to do things His way, not just your way. Let's all pray. Let's all stand up to our feet. This altar's open. If God's spoken to you, if God's talked to you, I want to invite you to come and find a place uh, here at the front and uh, find a place to pray. <laughs> Sit down or to kneel down and uh, talk to God. Uh, do business with God. We fall down. We fall down. We lay a crown. At the feet, talk to God. Hallelujah, Jesus, Lord. Greatness of His mercy and love. At the feet of Jesus, we cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. We cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 is lamb 
Hallelujah. Oh, we fall down. Talk to God. Put it in your own words, saints. He hears you. He knows the battle. He knows the struggle. He knows the pressure of the world, the pressure to fit in, the pressure to just get in line, family pressure. Sometimes it comes from co-workers. Sometimes it's our coming from within. Our, we haven't made up our minds. Perhaps there's a half-heartedness. There's a hesitation to really step all the way in. I don't know if I'm ready to fully commit to Jesus yet. The time God's calling you to Himself. He's saying, come and hear my voice. Maybe He's talking to you about your family. Maybe He's talking to you about attitudes. Maybe He's talking to you about issues in your heart. Hallelujah. If you'll surrender to Him, lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Oh, Shanda Rabba Kalaribe. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, Lord. Greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can play quietly. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is here tonight. You know, we have something precious here. A spiritual house. The Bible says he's building up a spiritual house. It's not just your life that's on the wheel that he's flashing in the clay, but it's all of us together as a church. He puts us on the wheel. and Sometimes when a deformity comes up, we can think, oh, well, man, how am I supposed to serve God? I'm all messed up. We forget that all of us are on the wheel. Sometimes that wheel feels like it's going really fast. All kinds of deformities come popping up. All of a sudden, you know, your kids get to age and they begin to ask inquisitive questions. Happens in marriage sometimes. Happens when you make a commitment to a ministry. You decide to go to another level, you get married. Begin to be discipled. You know what discipleship is? It's a wheel, man. It's a wheel where Jesus, the master potter, and then a pastor, the under shepherd, puts his hands up there too. And Jesus has his, hopefully, if a pastor's doing this right, has his hands on the, and then, there's the shaping of the, of the vessel. God uses people in His will, doesn't He? To help shape our lives. Get your hands off me. Are you saying that to God? God brings some conviction. Get your hands off me. God says, no, 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 no. That's not what you want. Let me. Come on. Come on, let's get this impurity out of here. One day I'm going to be a perfect vessel. Yeah, in heaven. The point of this life is to be on the wheel for the whole time. Let God continue to shape. I have a hunch when we get to heaven, all the deformities, or at least the big ones, are gone. But then there's more growth. There's more develop. There's more things to discover and grow and who knows what it's going to be like? <clears throat> Sometimes people get to a certain spot and they say, no, I don't want to go any further. And they, it's like a 
How odd would that be for a little half-made clay pot to grow legs and get off of that wheel? No, 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 no. Don't want to be here anymore. No, don't do that. Stay right there. Let the potter shape your life. Let him deal with those attitudes. Let him deal with those mindsets. Let him bring healing and peace. Let him bring some deformities, some conflict to the surface. I hate it when a person talks to me always pointing out all my flaws. Yeah, it's true. But be careful because it might be God helping you to see things that you couldn't otherwise see. I've had sinners call me on things, call me out on things. It's like, who do you on God's green earth think you are? And later God said, that wasn't just them, that was me. And I'm putting my hand on your life and I'm trying to help you. If you will just sit still on the wheel and let me bring some of these things out. I can't tell you how many times. Sometimes your kids call you out. Get thee behind me. Some of you parents, you know, you rebuke your kids. Amen. And I, I, I get it. You know, sometimes kids can be a little, a little overly zealous. I remember one particular family, you know, the parents would come, and, and if their mom and daddy were doing something, the kids would always come right up to me and just start talking about it. Amen. <laughs> it got to the point where was, I almost kind of had to shut them up, like, okay, listen, all right, all right that, that, we're working on it. Okay, shh, it's okay. Mom and dad, and the parents, the parents were like, oh, my goodness gracious. This is embarrassing. <clears throat> but if you let God do this, He's making something beautiful. He's not finished yet. It's not finished yet. That's not finished yet in your life. Some of you may have said to yourself, I'll never be beautiful. And God says, Don't say that. Don't don't say that. I've made you wonderful. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible says the Lord doesn't judge as man judges. The Lord doesn't see as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the inward things, the heart, the spirit, the things that the flesh covers up, but God can see through. Amen. Is God good tonight? We're going to close with a word of prayer. You stay in fellowship, love one another as you will. Amen. Take this to heart, beloved. God's, God's got a future for us. But if you're going through it, if you're facing some resistance, if you're facing some opposition, maybe even some righteous resistance, you're doing something right and you're getting treated ill for it, the Bible says to rejoice. I don't always feel like rejoicing when I'm doing something right and I get punished for it. But just a little bit of a news flash: the world isn't getting any nicer towards Jesus. And if they treated Him that way, isn't that what the Bible says? If they treated Christ that way, how much more will they treat you? We shouldn't be surprised as they begin to attack and assault the church. And I'm not trying to create an us versus them. You shouldn't do that. The people aren't the problem. It's the spirit behind it. Amen. The sin behind it. But you know, our God takes good notes. He's not one to forget. And the Bible says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro, looking for him whose heart is seeking the Lord. Hallelujah. Whose heart says, doesn't matter which direction the world's going, I want to follow the voice. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow His will. Let's pray. Would you stand with me to your feet and close with the word of prayer? Hallelujah. Amen. As we pray tonight, ask God's blessing. And uh, let's pray this evening. Jeff, would you pray for us tonight? Amen.
Amen. God bless you. You love one another this evening. Amen.